Okay, that's fine. That way people can watch it later on the YouTube channel also. All right, that sounds great. So, Mark, I just made you the host. Okay. I'm not sure what that changes or not, but. Well, that lets me share my screen. Um, okay. So I can put some PowerPoint up. People can take notes a little bit easier. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so um, I've never done this before like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yay for learning curves. <laughs> I'm trying to make you a full screen here on my end. Oh, there it is. There it is. All right. Much better. So now your face is really big here at the church. <laughs> Well, I hope I brush my teeth. That's all I got to say. <laughs> uh, okay. So, I don't know. I think we're ready to start because if people come in late, we can't wait for everyone. Uh, as, as, as people come in on my end, I could just let them into the room. But uh, like I said, you have, you know, various people already on and, and, a, and a church that's a quarter full. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So, so David, you'd like me to start then? Where do you go? Yes, yes, please. All right. Well, David, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. And I see some names. I see Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Alexandra. I see Alexandra. Hi, how are you? There's Larry. I don't see a picture of Larry, but at least I see these there. Carmen and a few others. Okay. So yeah, good to be with you all. And, uh, and also those who are joining in the church. I'm really glad to be able to share with you too. So what I'd like to do tonight is share with you, share with you my story of how I learned to hear God's voice. Uh, for some people, it's very simple. For me, it was really hard. <laughs> now, it's really simple to hear God's voice. It's just that no one could say to me how simple it was. No one could explain it. Um, I finally got it down to one sentence, which I'll just give to you now, and then we'll go into the sentence and we'll kind of break it out, break it open and, and help you explore the four points in the sentence. But here's the sentence, hearing God's voice, it's as simple as just quieting yourself down, fixing your eyes on Jesus, recognizing, recognizing that his voice is flowing thoughts that light up on your mind, and then writing out that flow of thoughts. So it's stillness and vision and spontaneity or flow and then journaling. So those are the four keys to hearing God's voice, which are very childlike, very easy. Stillness, vision, spontaneity, and journaling. And I wish somebody could have said to me <laughs> 10 years sooner, hey, Mark, hearing God's voice is as simple as quieting yourself down, fixing your eyes on Jesus, just picture him right there with you, and um, recognizing his voice as spontaneous flowing thoughts, and then just writing out that flow of thoughts that come to you. Because if they would have said that 10 years sooner, I could have heard God's voice when I first got saved at 15 years of age, but instead I was 25 years of age before I was able to hear God's voice. So it took me 10 years of intense struggle to learn that sentence and to learn these four keys that I shared with you. And all I want to do tonight is share with you some of my struggles, some of the things that didn't work, so you don't have to try them yourself, and then explore the four keys with some depth. Um, and then you'll be doing a 12-week course that follows up, which which takes everything into, well, there's 10 hours of teaching there. So instead of having me teach for an hour or so tonight or an hour and a half, I don't think I'll teach more than an hour, but um, then we'll do a practice exercise. We'll actually practice journaling and see how, how easy it is. And uh, then we'll share our experiences together. So it'll be very interactive and, and we'll do questions and answers too. So if you have questions as we go along, just jot them down and, and then we can uh, give you a chance before we close tonight to, to ask those questions. So. So I'm gonna keep my teaching probably to 45 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll go into the application section, all right? <laughs> so 
when I ask people, well, first of all, the church I got saved in said God wasn't speaking anymore. They said, since he finished writing the Bible, he quit talking. And, and I said, man, that's terrible. I said, he talked from Genesis to Revelation, then he gets the Bible written. And, uh, and now we, we don't get this anymore. And they said, yep, that's it. And I said, man, I wish I lived back in the days that Jesus was alive, because that's when things were cooking, you know, and, and my church didn't believe that miracles were happening today or dream or vision or God's voice or word of wisdom, word of knowledge, they dispensationalized all that away. So I was very disappointed that I was living today and not in the age when all those things were happening. Of course, what I realize now is that all those things are happening today and we can step into all of them. We can do every single one of them. And I have done all of them and uh, you can do all of them easy, easily. And, and the books that I have written tell you my, my story of learning how to do each one of those things. And we do have a book on four keys to hearing God's voice, which I'm sure will be part, part of your course that you take, you know, uh, with us, a 12 week course. So my church said I couldn't hear God's voice. So I left the church, you know, and, and I uh, went, went to college, uh, Roberts Wesson College, and, and they also told me we couldn't hear God's voice. Um, I finally turned charismatic, got open to the spirit um, last year in college. And, um, and <laughs> I was able to speak in tongues, but I still couldn't hear God's voice. You know, and when I, started pastoring a church, a charismatic church. I had a co-elder who could prophesy, who could hear God's voice very easily, and he could interpret tongues. And his name was Charles. And I said, Charles, you know, when you hear God's voice, what does it sound like? And he said, ah, oh, you just know that you know that you know that you know. And I said, no, I don't know, which is why I'm asking you, how do you hear God's voice? And he couldn't give me any, any other answer other than you know that you know that you know. And for a guy who doesn't know that, that's not an answer, okay? It's, it's a non-answer. And I found that very frustrating. I got very angry and backslid over that because here's a guy who can do it, but he can't explain how he does it, all right? So um, I tried the Baptist solution to everything because I grew up Baptist and that's just read more scripture. And so I sat down right to the New Testament in a, in a day and a half and went to my prayer closet and asked God to speak and I couldn't hear a voice. I couldn't identify a voice. I thought, well, that didn't work. So maybe I'll try the Pentecostal solution, which is you fast until you're skinny. So I did a 40 day fast. At least I was skinny, praise God, but I still couldn't hear God's voice. And I thought, huh, well, I couldn't make the Baptist solution didn't work. The Pentecostal solution didn't work. Asking a charismatic who could prophesy how you do it. He couldn't answer it. I said, man, now where do I go? You know? So, um, I invited a traveling charismatic teacher into our church. He taught him how to operate the nine manifestations of the spirit, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. And, and I thought when he's done teaching my church, I'm gonna take him home, sit him down, feed him some tea <laughs> and pin him to the wall and say, what does God's voice sound like? Cause you obviously can't operate word of wisdom or word of knowledge if you can't hear God's voice. And so I took him home, sat him down, asked him, he said, um, well, what most people consider the voice of God, it's nothing more than the subterranean rumblings of the spiritual mind. I said, what? He said, subterranean rumblings of the spiritual mind. I said, what is that? He said, well, it's just your heart rummaging around. It's not really God's voice at all. And I thought, are you kidding me? Here's a guy who teaches on the nine manifestations of the spirit. He cannot define how to hear God's voice. You talk about being blown away and angry and frustrated. I just decided to backslide again. I said, God, I can't stand it. There isn't a person I know, even when I invite people in from across the country, who can define how to hear your voice. And I couldn't wrap my head around that possibility. There was no one who could actually define it, but there wasn't. And um, so those are all the things I tried, including four years of Bible college. <laughs> None of them worked, <laughs> which means you don't have to try any of those because I've already tried them all. They didn't work. All right. So you can try something different than those things. Right. And um, I set the whole thing on, a, on the back burner after a year, a few years of frustration and um, decided to live out a biblical law. You know, I just got to go ahead and just live out of the Bible, you know. But it's the Pharisees who lived out of law. And I, real, I realize now that I was living like a Pharisee. I mean, I'm finding a rule, finding a command, trying to keep the command, grunting real hard. 
That's what Pharisees did. No, and that's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, I only do what I hear my father speaking, see my father doing. So he's not living out of the Bible. He knows the Bible. He's meditated on the Bible, but he's not living out of it. He is living out of the voice and vision of his father. He says, I think it's six times in, in the Gospel of John. I do nothing on my own initiative. It's only what I hear and only what I see. So he's really, really passionate about the fact you need to live by the spirit and walk by the spirit, which is what Galatians 5.25 says. We live and walk by the spirit. I said, well, I don't because, I mean, I've, I, I even ask people, I said, look, I'm assuming God's voice comes from my spirit. So maybe what you could do is you could help me define what my spirit feels like. And, and then maybe I could sense God's voice. And they said, well, your, your spirit doesn't feel like anything. I said, why not? They said, well, feelings are emotions and emotions are soulish. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess I was taught, taught that in Bible college. Now, that's not really true, okay, because the Bible does list emotions in your spirit. God sent Ezekiel embittered in the rage of his spirit. And that was how, the way he sent him out for his ministry, rage in his spirit. So emotions, are, they could be soulish if they're surfacy and reactionary, but they can also be birthed by the king of kings and lord of lords. The, they can be kingdom emotions, things like joy and peace. Kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace. Those are kingdom emotions, joy, and peace. And they're not in my soul. They're in my spirit. So uh, they said, well, they said, you know, you can't feel your spirit. I said, well, great. Could you tell me then how, how I can sense my spirit? They said, well, it's the innermost part of you. I said, no, that's where it's located. How do you sense your spirit? They said, oh, it's the part of you that talks to God. I said, no, that's what it does. How do you sense your spirit? Nobody could define for me how to sense my spirit. I'm supposed to walk in the spirit, pray in the spirit, live by the spirit, worship in spirit, and I can't define how to sense it, which means there's no way, there's no possible way that I can live by the spirit because I can't even define the experience. I can now, but I couldn't back then. And um, so I was stuck. I was very, very stuck. Put the whole thing in the back burner. Ten years into my Christian life, I had a thought come to me. (laughs) And the thought was, why don't you take a year of your life and focus on learning to hear God's voice? And I thought, man, a year of my life. Are you kidding? I went to college. We didn't take a year to learn a lesson. We had five courses every trimester. And that's 15 courses a year. I mean, I've never spent a year of my life to learn one thing. So I'm objecting to the thought. And a second thought comes drifting on through, you know, which was, you've already spent 10 years in diffused effort. You didn't get through. You spent one year in focused effort and you got through, it'd be the best year of your life. And I thought, huh, I I think that's true because at that point I had noticed in John that Jesus said over and over, I do nothing on my own initiative, only what I hear and see. So I decided that the center of Christianity was living like Jesus, living out of divine flow, out of the flow of the spirit, getting visions from God and and words from God. So I said, well, fine, I'm willing to risk a year of my life coming to the center of Christianity, seeing if I can't make it work in my own life, see if I can't prove that's true. If it's true, great. If it's not true, well, I'll go find what is true. But, you know, I, I, living out of biblical law just makes me feel guilty and condemned because I can't keep it. And of course, the Bible already said that. The Bible says the end of the law is death because it's just, it's just there as, as a custodian to keep you in check until the spirit comes to give you the power to live not only the law but way beyond the law but if i don't know anything if i don't know how to sense the power of the spirit i can't activate that and live on a much higher plane i can't now but back then i sure couldn't so i was very very stuck now that thought that came to me why don't you spend a year of your life (laughs) learning how to hear god's voice you want to take a wild guess where that thought came from (laughs) that was actually god's voice talking to me, telling me that, saying that. It was coming as a spontaneous, flowing thought. And at this point, I've now defined God's voice as spontaneous, flowing thoughts that light upon my mind. I did not have that definition back then. I, what I believed back then was, hey, it's a booming bass voice, you know, which, which I sure haven't heard every day of my life. I've heard it once in 70 years. So you can't really have a relationship based on a voice you heard once in 70 years. So most of the time, he comes as spontaneous flowing thoughts that light up on my mind. So, yeah, that, that was actually God talking to me, saying, come on, spend a year of your life. Let's, let's break through here. 
And even though I didn't know it was the voice of God, I figured it was a good idea because I, I, I really wanted the breakthrough. I, living under law and legalism and guilt and condemnation was not exciting. I even quit evangelizing because I just said, you know, all I do is whip myself on a daily basis for all my failures and to invite other people to whip themselves daily didn't seem very healthy. So for a period of my life, I didn't even feel I had anything positive enough to share, okay? I, that's changed at this point, obviously. So uh, I spent a year, year of my life focused on learning to hear God's voice. That was 1979. Now, focused means all my Bible meditation that year was on scripture passages that dealt with the voice of God or the vision of God. Just exploring them, meditating on them, trying to see what's in them that I was missing. It uh, also means that all my preaching would be on what I was learning. Um, all my experimentation, my Christian growth would be on learning to hear God's voice. If I went to a bookstore, the only book I would buy would be on prayer and hearing God's voice. If I went to a conference, it would be on prayer and hearing God's voice. That's focused effort. Every extra minute I have would be focused on learning this one skill. Now, that was a really great thing to do because halfway through that year, I learned how to hear God's voice. Uh, and I learned the second thing. I learned, hey, if you're stuck, all you have to do is focus intensely, you know, which means you're turning incandescent light into laser light, focus light. And that can burn through blockages, brain burn through concrete, burn through steel, whatever is in front of you that needs to be busted out of the way, it'll burn through. So every year since then, I've taken a year of my life to focus on mastering one more skill in the Lord. Because if I can master another important skill in walking in the spirit every year, you know, it's it's 50 years later, 45 years later. It means I get the chance to master 45 more skills, right? Which is why I've got 50 books in the market because it's each one's a year's growth. It's my battle to try to make something work that wasn't working, the things I tried that didn't work and the things that did work. So halfway through that year, God woke me up in the early morning with a booming bass voice, which as I mentioned, I've heard it once in 70 years. He said, get up, I'm gonna teach you to hear my voice. I got up, I went over to my office and uh, I lived at a parsonage, so just across the driveway. And he, he took me to Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2. Now Habakkuk's a prophet who can hear the voice of God and he can see vision and he can write down what God is saying to him. And in Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2, he's doing all of those things. <clears throat> and, uh, and the Lord showed me four keys to hearing his voice in Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2. Now I do have a PowerPoint that he's, which maybe if I can just see if I can share my screen here, um, I can, whoops. Um, it says, I'm sorry, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. There it is. So David, I don't know if you can give me the right to, a co-host or the right to share the screen, but if you can. I just gave you the permission. Ah, thank you, sir. All right. you're, you're a good man. <laughs> All right. So maybe we can see a screen here. You can see the four keys now, right? It's a black screen. It's a black screen. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Well, there, let me just, there it is. It was there. Okay, it was there. Okay, I just turned it off. Let me try it again then. Okay. So it was coming. It just took a moment. All right, got it. Okay, share one more time. <clears throat> okay, so maybe in another five or there 10 seconds. There it is. All right. <laughs> Whoa, I'm sorry. I'm hitting my screen here with my hand. Got to quit waving my hand around, I think. <clears throat> okay, so these are the four keys to hearing God's voice out of Habakkuk chapter two, verses one and two. And uh, let's see, I wonder if I can close this, if that would help. Yeah, that moves it over. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> Here's the two verses from Habakkuk. <clears throat> I will stand at my guard post. Key number one is in there. I will keep watch to see. Key number two is in there. What he will speak to me. Key number three is there. And key number four, then the Lord said, record the vision. So this prophet Habakkuk is doing four specific things, which I want to share with you what they are. And he's not the only prophet who did it. John did the same four things in Revelation. And I have a blog on our website showing, I think, about 15 different writers in the Bible who use these same four keys to, to receive revelation from God. So it's very, very universal, okay? So key number one 
he said, I'm going to go stand at my guard post. So key number one is we would have a place to just quiet ourselves in the Lord's presence. It could be a, a prayer room, a prayer closet, a living room sofa, a living room chair, kitchen sink where you peel potatoes, just any place where you can quiet your mind down and just fix your attention on the Lord. And I do think probably everybody who's listening today knows that if you want to hear God's voice, you are supposed to still your thoughts. Okay, that, that's pretty standard, I believe. However, <laughs> I was taught, don't you dare still your mind, because if you do, Satan could move upon it. And uh, I thought, oh, I don't want that. So I got one part of me saying to my mind, mind, shh. The other part of me is saying, don't you dare, shh, because Satan will get you. So with that kind of inner tension, it's really difficult to, to quiet myself down, because inwardly, I'm, in, I'm not in unity about the issue, is it right to quiet my mind or not? So, of course, the Bible does say, be, David says, be silent, my soul, before him. I mean, that, I think it's Psalm 61. So he's commanding his soul to shh, just quiet down, all right? And uh, the Bible does say, say, be still and know that I am God. So I didn't think the Bible is very, very clear, plus all of his seal of times in the Psalms. He would pause a musical crescendo, and he's in the presence of God just pondering, you know, what the words have been flowing. So I became convinced that it's right to still your mind. And I was also convinced that my fear of stilling my mind because Satan would get me was a demonic fear. Because fear is nothing more than faith in reverse. Fear is me believing more in the power of Satan or a demon to spot, speak to me than I have faith in the Holy Spirit to speak to me. And the Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So, man, if my faith is, hey, Satan's going to talk to me and Jesus isn't, well, that's probably what's going to happen. Satan's going to talk to me and Jesus isn't because faith works. Whether I use it in forward gear or reverse gear, faith works. And I'm telling you, I am personally sick and tired. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I should use the word sick and tired. I don't want to be sick or tired. And so watch my <laughs> confession. But I'm perfectly, I'm, I'm completely over believing for the power to take over, power of Satan to take over my life. I believed for it for way too many years. I believed in the Antichrist taking over the world. I, I, and I've just quit. I've just given it all up for a and said, no. It's all about the risen Christ and what Jesus accomplished on Calvary. It's not about Satan. He has no authority. He has no power. I'm crystal clear that Jesus took all authority and all power when he was raised uh, from the dead. And he has all authority and power, and he's using it, and we're seated with him to use it also uh, in heavenly places. Ephesians, very clear about that. So I'm not going to give any power back to Satan, not since Jesus paid the ultimate price to strip it from him. I'm not going to believe that he has any power to do anything. And I've heard some people say, wow, you know, everything's going so good. I just know Satan's now going to hit me with something. Well, why would I want to believe Satan has the power to hit me with anything? Tell you what I believe. <laughs> I believe that I'm hidden under the shelter of God's wings. And if I'm hidden under the shelter of his wings, as the Bible says, Satan can't even find me, much less touch me. So I don't believe Satan has any power to touch me anyway, because if we choose to believe he does, then he does. If we choose to believe he doesn't, then he doesn't. All right. So I got, I repented. <laughs> for believing that Satan had power. And I prayed a prayer of repentance, which I'm just gonna pray that prayer now, because if you need to pray that prayer, you can just in your heart agree along with this prayer. I like to pray prayers of repentance because it gets me out of boxes and prisons and it gets me on in my Christian life. So I always celebrate anytime I get a chance to repent. <laughs> it's a step forward. So let me just pray. Father, I thank you for the power of your word to instruct our lives. And Father, I thank you that you have complete authority, complete power in the universe and in our lives. And Father, right now, I just want to repent for any belief that I have had that Satan had authority or power in my life to speak to me or to harass me or to do anything because you stripped him of his power through your death, through your crucifixion. You paid the price to strip him of all authority and I will not put any faith in any 
misled authority that Satan might still have. He does not have any. So, Lord Jesus, I repent for my faith in the power of Satan or the Antichrist. And, Lord Jesus, I choose to believe what you have said in your word, that when I ask for the spirit, I receive the spirit. And I do not get a serpent. I do not get a dove. I receive the spirit. You promised it. I believe it. That settles it. And I come against fear, doubt, and unbelief, and I break it off from me in the name of Jesus. I bind it and I cast it away and say, you have no place in me. Fear, doubt, and unbelief, be gone, be gone, be gone. You have no authority in my life. I am free, free in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so that was a good prayer. I got over my fear of Satan. <laughs> and so then I could go on to step number two, all right? And, and um, and we have a whole, by the way, we have a whole chapter on, on each one of these four keys. And uh, so we expand them out and we give you lots of easy things you can do to make them work. We even have a free downloadable uh, Sea of Galilee uh, audio and video on our website. Uh, and uh, it's a, called the Sea of Galilee. And, and we take you for a stroll with Jesus for five minutes along the Sea of Galilee. So your eyes are fixed on Jesus. You're together with him. Uh, you've got a smile on your face, you're tuned to flow. And so we help bring you to that point of stillness in the presence of Jesus. And that's just something free that you can download and use. So if you're having trouble becoming still, <laughs> that'll help you. Key number two is actually one of the best techniques that I know to become still. Key number two, he said, I'm going to keep watch to see what he will speak to me. <laughs> I'm going to keep watch to see what he will speak to me. <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I said, man, you know what? If I was writing that sentence, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said, I'm going to listen to hear what he's going to speak. And I had no idea what he was trying to see. Because when I, when I used to go to God and ask him to speak to me, I wasn't trying to see anything. I was just trying to hear. That wasn't hearing, but at least I was trying real hard. And I didn't have any idea what Habakkuk's doing, this keep watch and see thing. And so the Lord showed me key number two. He said, Mark, look for vision as you pray. Look for vision as you pray. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of vision in the Bible. It starts in Genesis 15. God gives Abraham a vision of the stars in the sky. And it ends in, Genesis, in, in Revelation 22, from cover to cover in the Bible, God is giving vision. And Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. But guess what? In my entire Christian life, I had never once looked for a vision, <laughs> which, of course, raises an interesting question. You want to take a wild guess how many visions I got in the first 10 years of my Christian life? None. Because the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And because I was never asking for vision, I was never receiving vision. And um, so, so that's, and of course, another thing I had to repent of. I mean, Paul, Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. That's Ephesians 1.17. And uh, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. So he's praying for his ability to see in the spirit realm and to get enlightenment, to get revelation, to get vision from God. You know what? <laughs> I never prayed that prayer. I mean, I said it was Bible believing, but I sure had never, never, never prayed that prayer. Lord, would you enlighten the eyes of my heart? Let me see vision. I just said, never prayed it. So let me tell you about the first time that I saw a vision. Use the eyes of my heart intentionally and looked for a vision. It was in my early morning devotions. And um, I had read. John chapter four, the Samaritan woman at the well. And so I grew up in a dairy farm, so I could picture that scene very comfortably. I could picture, you know, beautiful, beautiful summer day, you know, and beautiful blue sky. And there's a big round well. And there's Jesus sitting there on the edge of the well, long flowing white robe, sandals on his feet, you know, very gentle countenance. And so I'm, I'm picturing this. Now, that's, this is part of Bible meditation. 
the word in, the, in Joshua 1 8, where it says meditate my word day and night. Yeah. If you look up the Hebrew word there, you're going to see that one of the definitions given for it is imagine. So part of Bible meditation is you are imagining what you're reading. And, I, and I, as I poll people in groups, when I teach groups, and I say, how about show of hands? How many of you uh, picture Bible stories when you read them? Usually about 90, 85, 90% of the people raise their hands and say, yeah, I picture Bible stories. So, so they are using the eyes or heart properly. That's part of imagination is part of Bible meditation. And so that's good. Um, I was never purposely doing that because I'm a left brain thinker, not a right brain seer. So seeing came hard for me, all right? Uh, for right brains, people, they, they picture very, very easily, okay? And uh, they can't understand why the people like me have such a tr so much problem with it, okay? So I was picturing that scene in my mind, Jesus sitting on the edge of a well. And then the question was, who's gonna be sitting next to him? Would it be the Samaritan woman or could it be me sitting there next to Jesus in this scene in my mind? Well, the answer to that question is, is it okay for you and I to put our names in a Bible promise that's in the Bible? Like, by his stripes, I, Mark Berkler, am healed. Is it okay to do that? And I think we would all agree, sure, it's perfectly fine to put your name in a Bible promise and personalize it. So the next question is, is it okay for me to do that pictorially? Uh, can I put myself in a Bible story and picture myself as one of the characters in the story? And I think, sure, no reason not to. As a matter of fact, when I poll people, there's this maybe about 20, 25% 20, of the people who will picture themselves in Bible stories when they read them, okay? Which is very interesting because, I mean, it's like here's 75% of the people who aren't picturing themselves in the Bible story, here's 25% who are. Isn't that interesting? Because I kind of assumed that everybody read the Bible the way I read the Bible. Boy, that is not the truth at all. People do a lot of things differently on the inside. And what I want to do tonight and in the course you're going to take is define what people are doing on the inside so we can all be doing the right things and the best things, biblically speaking, so we can get the best possible results in our lives. And then the follow-up question I'll ask people in a seminar, I'll say, how many of you do go even one step further? And after you picture yourself in the scene, the Bible story, how many then pray that prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.17? I pray that the eyes of my heart would be enlightened. How many pray, Holy Spirit, would you take over this scene in my mind? Would you bring it alive? And, and then the whole thing just comes alive and you kind of step into a vision. And when I ask how many do that, <laughs> Unfortunately, it's only about 5% of the people who do that. But it's really interesting to me, 5% of the people do do that. They are reading the Bible not properly. That's Bible meditation. And the other 95% of us need to do the same thing. We need to start doing that. And at this point in my life, that is the way I read the Bible. I, I do do that. Okay, so let me explain what happened this particular morning. So I'm picturing myself sitting on the well next to Jesus. I consider this, I would define this as Bible meditation or as godly imagination. And I define godly imagination as picturing things God says are so. I got to picture something, okay? And uh, there's no chance I'm not going to be picturing something, all right? Um, I might not be aware of what I'm picturing, <laughs> but at this point in my life, I'm totally aware of what I'm picturing. I... I because we, we know a picture is worth a thousand words. I went to Word of Faith Church for 10 years or so just to learn faith because I was such a mighty man of fear and doubt and unbelief. I really hated myself for it. And they taught, they preached week after week, you know, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I would confess it. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But I'm picturing myself as a miserable, low down sinner. So if I confess, thousand times i'm the righteousness of god in christ jesus and i'm picturing myself as a miserable sinner what which one wins <laughs> the picture or the confession well we know a picture's picture's worth a thousand words and we, we can back that up scripturally that that phrase a picture's worth a thousand words very easily in john in in genesis 15 where god gave abraham a picture of millions of stars and he said you're going to have that many children the next verse 
chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, says, then Abram believed. So as soon as God gave him a picture of the promise fulfilled, faith was inflamed in his heart. And the Bible, by the way, just happens to be a picture book. It's just story after story after story after story. And Jesus, when he taught, it was parables. Without a parable, he taught them not story after story, picture, picture, picture. All. And the only reason you tell a story is to get people to picture. And um, unfortunately, at this point in, in church history, some people are afraid of picturing at all. They're afraid of imagination. Because And the reason they're afraid of it is, is because New Agers use it, do it. And they say, wow, it's a New Age technique. And I say, well, excuse me, hold it. The New Agers are the counterfeiters. And you only, count, you only counterfeit things that are true there's no counterfeit six dollar bills there's not a real six dollar bill there's no no counterfeit one dollar bills are not worth counterfeiting so if the new age is out there doing this that means there is a real and it has value and i want to go to the bible and i did go to the bible looked up every single verse on dream and vision and imagination saying god help me build a theology concerning the proper use of the eyes of my heart because i'll tell you here's here's the only thing i'm doing with the eyes of my heart right now I'm picturing fear, doubt, unbelief, the Antichrist, and lust, okay? So I'm doing a ton of picturing. It's just all crud, 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 pulling me down into a hole, you know? So it's not that I wasn't picturing. I was just picturing awful stuff, okay? So now I've learned not to do that. I've learned to fill my eyes with what the Bible says. And the Bible's written. You say, well, okay, if, if I'm going to look, if I'm going to keep watch to see like Habakkuk does, what... What am, I to, what am I going to look for? Well, the New Testament's crystal clear. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. That's the only command in the entire New Testament about where my eyes are supposed to be fixed. So I'm going to be picturing Jesus. Where? <laughs> well, actually, he's, he's omnipresent. So there's any place I wanted to picture him would be perfectly bi biblical. But he says that he's God with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So that's, that's the way King David pictured the Lord. In Acts 2, 25 or 35, he says, um, I have set the Lord at my right hand. I, you know, he said, I behold the Lord at my right hand and I will not be shaken. So he's picturing the Lord at his right hand. And he's quoting Psalm 16, 8, where he says, I set the Lord at my right hand and I will not be shaken. So he's intentionally taking the eyes of his heart, picturing the Lord with him. That's, I would call that godly imagination, okay? <laughs> Got to picture something at my right hand. I could picture that there's nobody at my right hand. But of course, that would be, a, that would be an evil imagination because that picture is contrary to the word of God. And I define evil imagination as picturing things contrary to the word of God. So if I'm going to picture there's nobody at my right hand, Jesus isn't there. I have an evil imagination of the Bible. It's crystal clear what's going to happen. I'm going to go backwards and not forwards. And I'll tell you how I go backwards. Since Jesus, I can't see him around, around me. And, I'm, and the forces around me are so big and so powerful. I just move into fear, doubt, anger, anguish, depression, loneliness, abandonment. That's backwards. That's all backwards. So there's no such thing as me not picturing. I'm either going to picture there's nobody here which is an evil imagination. I'm going to picture Jesus here. King David said, I set the Lord at my right hand. So I decided, hey, sure, I'm going to do that. So here I am in this morning. I'm picturing myself sitting at the edge of the well, and I'm looking over at Jesus. So I'm picturing Jesus as Emmanuel God with me. It's the first time I've ever done that in my entire life. And uh, this is 10 years into my Christian life, which boggles my mind that I can, for 10 years, not do something so clearly taught in scripture and exemplified in scripture. So um, picture Jesus there at my right hand. I can see him from the neck on down. Uh, didn't see his face for the first few days or weeks, but within a couple of weeks, I was seeing his face and he was laughing hilariously and having a really good time. And he always said, Mark, lighten up. I got everything under control. I said, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm very sure. I'm King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I rule in the realm of mankind. And and he wanted me to believe that because I had been taught the opposite, that Satan ruled, that the Antichrist ruled. And he was very upset with the fact that his church believes that the guy that he defeated on Calvary through paying the ultimate price, that they have resurrected that guy, the Antichrist, 
and believe that he's the one that rules. I mean, the word antichrist shows up four times in the Bible, and it's clearly defined as somebody, it's in the first, it's first John. You can just go look them up, all right? It's, and they said, well, isn't the whole book about the book of Revelation about the antichrist? You know what? The antichrist isn't even, the word is not even mentioned in the book of Revelation, not even mentioned. And we've made this whole thing as a terror book. And the first verse of Revelation is very clear. It said, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ signified, told to us in signs and symbols. And it's about Jesus' glory, his grandeur, and his splendor. So cleaning up pictures <laughs> um, took me several months to clean up pictures. Probably took me a year to clean all the cruddy pictures out of my mind and only picture things the Bible said were true. Okay. Okay, so I'm picturing Jesus here next to me. <laughs> um, I'm sitting at the edge of the well. Um, in Samaria, picturing Jesus next to me, long flowing robes, then I pray Ephesians 1.17. Uh, Lord, I pray that the eyes of my heart would be in light. Lord, would you just bring this scene alive and let me step into a vision? And as I prayed that and tuned to flow, the scene just came alive and I stepped right into a vision. Jesus gestured and then a spontaneous flowing thought came to me, which was really simple. Um, I hope my husband wrote it down and said, well, that was good. But, you know, simple but good, all right? That's Christianity, simple but good. And so I closed my eyes, looked back at the scene and said, Lord, is there more you want to say? And another flowing thought came and I wrote that down. I mean, the first thought that came was um, love unconditionally because I was actually asking the Lord, Lord, how do I handle this foster child I've taken into my home? Um, she, her parents went to our church. She had ran away from their home. Her parents asked us to take their daughter into our home. So Patty and I were trying to minister to this 15 year old rebellious kid and she's breaking all the rules. And I just wanted to punch her out, you know, and give her the reader of the riot act. And, and so what she snuck off her school, so I couldn't. So this first day that I journaled, I was asking the Lord, Lord, how do I handle Renee? And the phrase that came was when the scene came alive and Jesus gestured, love unconditionally. I said, okay, that's not punching her out, is it? Okay. And, uh, Second phrase that came, she's very insecure. And I said, man, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking she's very rebellious. And I thought, well, maybe rebellion's the facade that you put on when you are insecure. And so maybe I should be ministering to her broken heart and not to her facade. So when she came home, I did that. I spent about an hour just chatting and building a deeper relationship. And I'm pretty sure I gave her a rule or two at the end, but mostly we built a deeper relationship and I didn't read her the riot act, which means she did not run away from my home. She stayed and came to church for the whole next year, which is good fruit. The Bible says you can test things by the fruit. That was good fruit. So basically what I'm saying in this story, all of your interpersonal relationships will improve uh, as you hear God's voice. Uh, my wife said her marriage improved greatly when I learned to hear God's voice. <laughs> Um, cause the Lord said really deep things to me, like Mark, uh, love your wife. I said, well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to love her just as soon as I fix her. And he said, I didn't say anything about fixing your wife. I said, love your wife. I told me that about 50 times and I finally got it. And I just decided to love Patty just the way she was without changing her into Mark for the second. And I just thought she'd be happier if she had more of my personality. And she was pretty sure she would not be happier with more, than, with more of my personality. So, uh, the Lord taught me to honor her the way God built her and not try to remake her. Now, if that doesn't improve a marriage oh, about a thousand fold, nothing will, okay? So every one of your interpersonal relationships, your children, your family, your spouse, parents, grandparents, it's all gonna improve tremendously as you hear God's voice. Okay, so that's the first time I use vision intentionally. I, now, let me define theologically what happened here in that story. I began with a godly imagination, which is picturing or a Bible meditation, which is picturing something I know that's true, which is Jesus is Emmanuel, God with me. I prayed over that, Ephesians 1, 17, asking the spirit to bring alive. He did. The scene came alive. And when it came alive, I'm stepping from a godly imagination into a vision. I want to say it again. When it came alive, I'm stepping from a godly imagination into a vision. And I realized, hey, I can do this all the time. I can do this every single morning of my devotion. I can do this anytime, which means I can step into vision any point in time in my life, which is now I'm getting to the point where Jesus was at. 
I do only what I see my father doing. I now have a pathway a into a visionary encounter with Almighty God, and I did not have a pathway before this. Now I have a biblical pathway. pathway. People say, well, I can do it through drugs. Well, maybe you can do it through drugs, but that's not a biblical pathway, okay? What I've described is a biblical pathway. So that's the first, um, that's key number two of my, my first day of using vision. You will have a whole two hours of video where I teach on vision going through all, all the stuff, ins and outs, okay? So let's go to key number three. <clears throat> okay, key number three. <clears throat> Habakkuk said he's going to keep watch to see what he will speak to me. So what does God's voice sound like? Key number three is God's voice often comes as spontaneous flowing thoughts. <laughs> God's voice often comes as a spontaneous flowing thought. That's a really simple definition for, for God's voice. I was expecting a booming, booming bass voice, which I don't really get, really get. But I sure do get spontaneous flowing thoughts every day. And every single person gets flowing thoughts every day. If it's that simple, this just became simple enough for children, which is exactly what the Bible said. You have to become like a little child if you want to enter the kingdom. Now, the young children, they live in flow. Up till age seven, they just live in flow. So we're becoming childlike. So is there biblical support that flow, flowing thoughts, is the voice of God? They're sure. I'll give you a verse. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit. So we have a spirit within, which we received when we got saved and invited Jesus into our heart. Holy Spirit came in, joined with our spirit. Now, Spirit, one of the pictures of spirit is as a river that flows from the throne room of God down through the city through Jerusalem and into my heart when I embrace Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And that river can flow out through any faculty. If I yield my vocal cords to flow, I can speak in tongues. I just yielded my vocal cords to flow, did not control them myself, and let anything flow out that wanted to. At that point, it was a miracle, spoken tongues. When I yield my mind to flow and let flow anoint my reasoning and quicken my thoughts and give me brilliant insights, that's called the mind of Christ. When I yield my hands to flow and lay them on somebody, I can feel a flow of energy and power, which feels like heat and vibration that will be leaving my hands and entering that person's body to, to, to heal them. So um, any faculty we yield to flow at that point in time that faculty is an extension of Jesus Christ, okay? So flowing thoughts out of your innermost being shall flow. <laughs> See, I didn't have a theology for flow. I didn't have a theology about thoughts at all other than I, I used to believe, hey, if the thought's in my head, it's my thought, which is not a biblical theology at all. Because the Bible says we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because we're in a warfare against principalities and powers. So, so that means, I mean, Satan can, put thoughts into your head and your heart. Why has Satan put this thought to, de to deceive? I mean, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, why has Satan entered your heart and gave him this thought, you know, to, to lie, okay? So we know the accuser, the slanderer can put thoughts in our mind. That's why we take him captive. So for me to believe that the, all the thoughts in my head are mind is, is biblically stupid, okay? Because the Bible clearly says that's not the way it is. Um, Satan can give me flowing thoughts that are negative and destructive and accusative. And, uh, and God can give me flowing thoughts, which are life-giving and energizing. And, and they're, they're both happening pretty much all the time. Of course, the more we, I choose to focus only on God's thoughts, then the dark, thoughts of darkness don't have a place to land. And they slip away quite quickly and quite easily. And that's so you can train your mind to move towards the light or move towards the darkness. Okay. I'm going to go with pornography, then I'm going to train myself to go towards evil and darkness, okay? So, flowing thoughts. So, I believe I got three, I believe I got three kinds of thoughts within me. I got analytical thoughts, cognitive, connected, rational thoughts, analytical. That's me thinking myself, controlling my mind myself. Two plus two is a four. That's Mark Burke for thinking, all right? Uh, then we got spontaneous flowing thoughts that line up with the names of Satan, accuser, adversary, liar, thief, destroyer, um, slanderer, 
uh, all of those spontaneous thoughts I would consider coming from a demon. And so if I have those thoughts in my mind, I just simply say, in the name of Jesus, I bind that demon and I command you to leave right now in Jesus' name, because I don't really want to give those thoughts a place to rest. And in the other category, we have spontaneous flowing thoughts that line up with the names of Jesus. He's a comforter. He's a healer. He's a teacher. He's an edifier. He gives life. So any spontaneous flowing thought that I have that gives life, it's comforting, it's encouraging, it's light, it's teaching, instructive, I consider that coming from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so when a thought, when I'm working on a thought in my mind, <clears throat> I'm going to ask, where did it come from? Did it come through calculating and reasoning? If it did, it's Mark Berkeley's thoughts. And I don't see much value in Mark Berkeley's thoughts, okay? I mean, if Jesus only did what he's if he did nothing on his own initiative, that means he didn't think on his own initiative. So that means I shouldn't think on my own initiative either. I mean, Abraham and uh, when, when Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a child, they used their own thought process to come up with a child. And, and you can go into Hagar, my, my concubine, and have a child through her and have a child. But that was man's reasoning. That wasn't revelation knowledge. And God said, I'm not gonna accept Isaac. This didn't come from my spirit. This was your thinking. And you say, well, is my thinking all that bad? Well, it started the 3,000-year-old war. It's still going on over there between the Arabs and the Israelites. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. So I choose to scrap Mark Ripper's thinkings. I choose to bind and cast out all spontaneous flowing thoughts that are lined up with the names of Satan. And I choose to embrace and walk in all flowing thoughts that line up with the names of Jesus. So I'm very careful to separate the thoughts in my mind in three categories, which I had no consciousness of before I learned to hear God's voice. But now I do have a consciousness of that. Okay. Next point. Let's see. We can make this. There we go. Key number four. Then the Lord said to Habakkuk, record the vision. Get a pen out, get a pencil out, get something out and write. Get your iPhone out and speak into it. Let it type for you if you want to. Get on your laptop computer, your iPad, and just type, okay? I do all pretty much all of my journaling on, on my laptop computer. So key number four is we write out the flow of thoughts and visions or pictures within us. And we're going to call that two-way journaling. A little bit different than journaling because journaling can be one way. And I don't want my prayer to be one way. I don't want my relationship with Patty, my wife, to be one way. I want us to have a dialogue back and forth. I don't want to monopolize it either. I want, I want to give her plenty of time to share her heart. So same is true with God. I, but the Bible actually says in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. He's in heaven, you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So usually when I come to God in journaling, I say, I say good morning, Lord. <laughs> I love you. I give you today, what would you like to say to me? So I just start out with love and adoration and an open heart to let him talk about whatever he wants to talk about. I tune to flow and then I'll write a whole paragraph or half a page from flow. And if I've got questions about what he's saying, I'll, I'll throw them in and say, well, Lord, what do you mean when you say this? You know, And, and then I'll tune to flow. And, and so it's a two-way conversation back and forth, which you do see in the prophets in their writing. They did that in Psalms. You'll see that places in the Psalms. And you'll see in the book of Revelation, you know, actually we've got hundreds of chapters in the Bible of people writing out their dialogue with God on paper, you know, <laughs> and I'd never done that. <clears throat> and when this idea first was presented, I thought, no, <laughs> I said, I hate writing. I hate English. I hate grammar. I hate spelling. My prayer time already does not work. If you're thinking I'm going to write it out, man, this is not going to work. Okay. So I'm kind of expressing that attitude towards God. And God said, you know what? If your approach isn't working so well, you could just try my approach just in case I know something, you know? So I said, fine, God, I'll try these. I'll try these four keys and I'll try journaling just to prove to you it doesn't work for me because, you know, the writing sounds like something a woman might want to do or a sissy or a Catholic, but I don't think a man, a Tarzan kind of a man really wants to write. So of course, King David, for crying out loud, he was a mighty, mighty warrior and he wrote, well, he didn't write all the 150 songs, but he sure wrote a lot of them. So you can be a mighty, mighty man and warrior and still be a writer, okay? It, it was just a stupid figment of my, my imagination, the way I was picturing reality, okay? So 
No. I got this paper out and I quieted myself down. I said, good morning, Lord. What do you want to say to me? And I tuned to flow and flow kicked in. I had some flowing thoughts that came and I wrote down like a paragraph of, out of flow and the flow was done. And so I took it. I thought, what in the world is this? This is my first day for doing this, you know? I, I took it to my wife, Patty, because she is definitely more spiritual than me. She's more loving, more kind, more nurturing, and more spiritual, more right brain, and more intuitive, and more visionary. Okay. And uh, I married well. What can I say? So I said, Patty, what is this? And she read it and she said, Well, that's God talking to you. I said, Are you sure? She said, Yes. Well, my level of faith went up. And I needed my level of faith to go up because no one had taught, taught me God's voice comes as flowing thoughts. And if you fix your picture Jesus there with you and ask him a question, come into his presence and tune to flow, the flow that you get and record on paper, that will be his voice. No one had ever said anything like that. So, man, I'm just kind of out there experimenting and Jesus and Patty said, that's God. So with increased faith, I went back and did it again. Came still, pictured Jesus, tuned to flow and wrote another half a page. And I took it to Patty and she said, yeah, that's still God. <laughs> and my faith went up again. So I went back and I did it again. Stillness, vision, spontaneity, flow. Got another half page, took it to Patty. She said, yep, that's still God. <laughs> now I did that all day because I've been hungering for this for 10 years of my Christian life. And no one could say stillness, vision, spontaneity, flow. No one could say that. Stillness, vision, spontaneity, and journaling. All right. So I was so ecstatic that I had, this was the breakthrough of my Christian life because now, Rather than living out of biblical law like legalists and Pharisees did, I could now live out of a relationship with a person that we could talk together and chat together, which that's what a relationship is. It's people who, who talk, who see each other, who talk, who feel each other, each other's emotions, and, and now I can do all, all of those things where before I couldn't, right? Because I had no, no theology of flow. So those are the four keys. They're very simple. They're very easy. <laughs> And um, it is very important to uh, share your journaling with somebody because this next PowerPoint, we're going to test our journaling after we receive it. And uh, we're just going to say, hey, does it, is it compatible with scripture? Uh, does it line up with the names of Jesus? Does it produce peace in my heart? Those are three great ways to test your journaling right there. And another fourth way, which is really crucially important, when I read what God said to my three spiritual advisors, does their heart affirm the journaling came from God? Because the Bible said in the mouth of counselors, there's wisdom and safety. And the Bible said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every rhema is confirmed. So I am not the one who confirms my own journaling. I take it to two or three people that I respect. One is my wife. Another is my daughter. Uh, another would be my son. They, they're, they're both now grown. They both work full time in our ministry. Um, and uh, hey, if they all, and, and I don't ask them what they think about it. Don't ever ask anyone what they think about anything because you're, you're going to lead them into sin because they're going to start thinking cognitively and linearly. And I really personally think that's a sin. That's, that's how you get I, Isaacs, you know, and that's how you start 3,000 year old wars and that's how you get messes in your life. So I gave up thinking on my own. In 1980, okay, that was 40 years ago. And I, and I want the mind of Christ. I want my thinking guided by the flow of the Holy Spirit. So I say, Lord, what's your thoughts on this? I tune to flow. And he illumines my understanding. Flow quickens my thinking. I get brilliant flashes. And I, wow, that's better than I was thinking. And that's terrific, you know. And I journal that out. So that's the way my mind gets used now. It's the Holy Spirit using my mind not Mark Berkler using my mind because Mark Berkler isn't alive. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't live, it's Christ who lives. So for me to resurrect myself and say, I'm alive again, you know, and start doing stuff on my own, that's sure not the way Jesus lived. He, he said, I do nothing on my own initiative. So I want to live like Jesus lived. I want to be anointed. So why is it <laughs> that journaling release the voice of God within me instead of crumpling it all up and making it not work? And here's the answer to that question. Because, and the Lord pointed this out to me. He said, Mark, he said, before you knew enough to write it down, you would ask me a question. And as soon as I would get two words out of my mouth, you would say, hmm, 
wonder if that came from God. <laughs> well, hmm is not faith. What's whom? What's hmm? Hmm is doubt. And so I shift from faith to doubt, jam the receiver, hang up on God, because God says those who come to me must come in faith. I would come in faith for two seconds, and I would shift the doubt and jam the receiver. And so the Lord said, Mark, when you journal, you don't have to doubt while you're receiving. You can just stay in faith for five minutes. The flow is kicked in. You can write in faith for five minutes because you know when the flow is done, then you can go back and then you can say, hmm, did this come from God? And you can test it against scripture and submit it to your spiritual advisors. But then you're not jamming the receiver because you already gave me five minutes to talk to you or 10 minutes to talk to you or 15 minutes to talk to you. So journaling lets you stay in faith for an extended period of time, knowing you can test it later, which means you don't have to test it now. Now that's a million dollar gift, which is why we have hundreds of chapters in the Bible exemplifying journaling. And when God spends several hundred chapters to exemplify a process, it's worth doing, right? <laughs> and um, so, my concluding thought on this, and I think I'm done teaching basically, is I'm not suggesting anyone use two of these keys or three of these keys. I'm very strongly saying use four keys, the same four that Habakkuk used, stillness, vision, spontaneity, and journaling, and you will hear God's voice every single day of your life. And if you go to Revelation chapter one, verses nine to 11, <coughs> excuse me, just a second. <laughs> Revelation 1, 9 to 11, you will find that John used the same four keys. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, stillness. I heard a voice behind me, <clears throat> spontaneating flow, saying, write, journaling, in a book what you see, vision. Revelation 1, 9 to 11, the same four keys used by the guy who wrote 22 chapters, two visionary encounters, who was a beloved disciple who also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, plus the Gospel of John. <clears throat> So these are standard tools if you want to operate in the prophetic or if you want to have a love relationship with Jesus, okay? So I'm asking you to use all four. All right, let's see if we got another PowerPoint. Yeah, okay, and so I am done teaching. <clears throat> so this gives us a chance to actually try this, um, which would be like about a, an eight minute exercise here that, that we'll be doing or about four minutes, yeah, eight minutes, yeah. So I'd like us to try these four keys. So hopefully you've got pencil or paper or a computer that you can type on or an iPad or an iPhone that you can talk into that can type for you. Um, if you don't have one of those things, would you try to grab one of those things right now? <clears throat> if you're in the church group, just make sure people around you all have something to write with. Pencil, paper, something that they can work with there. <clears throat> and what I'd like us to do is to do a two-way love letter between you and Jesus. Um, and you'll see in the two-way, we're going to do two paragraphs. First paragraph, you'll be doing some talking. Second paragraph, you're going to tune to flow and write from flow and let Jesus do some talking. So in paragraph one, the question we have here in the PowerPoint, um, Lord, here's one of the reasons I love you so much. So you're gonna be showing gratitude towards Jesus, which is what the Bible says. We enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart. We enter his courts with praise. So when I wanna come into his presence, I don't come in saying, God, I got this big screaming problem, let's talk. That's not showing honor to the king. <clears throat> So we always enter by getting in a relationship, relational mode first, and just honoring our Lord. So one of the ways you can honor him is we're going to give you four minutes to write a paragraph, just expressing to him one of the reasons you love him so much, because of what he's done for you, any, any number of things he's done for you. And I know you can write for hours, but I want to keep it to four minutes, and I will let you know when four minutes is up, because at the end of four minutes, we want to let him talk. So it'll be paragraph two and he'll be talking. And, and I want you to let him tell you how much he loves you. So it's a two-way love letter back and forth. 
You express your love, he expresses his love. We're gonna do four minutes for each paragraph. I will time you and let you know when the four minutes and eight minutes are up. Then we'll come back as a group and uh, we'll let a few people share their journey if they'd like to, and we'll take questions and answers. And that'll probably then close us out, all right? So let me just lead, you, lead us in prayer. <clears throat> let people in. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. <clears throat> we thank you for Calvary. Thank you for all the exchanges that you made for us. You took our sin. You took our sickness. You took our weakness. You got bent towards sinning. You took our evil nature. And you gave us yourself back so many gifts back and lord you gave us the holy spirit so that we can commune easily and directly with you as children so lord right now i ask that you would help each person to become childlike as they do this two-way journaling holy spirit i ask that you would anoint our hearts and minds that we could easily receive from you and i thank you lord for what you do and just before you start, I'm going to tell you two little tricks that I use that really make this easier. One is I picture myself as a kid because that gets my frontal lobe and my thinking, critical reasoning out of the way. So if the Bible says come as a child, I'm going to picture myself as a child. And that'll help a lot. And the second thing I do, I put a great big smile on my face because I can't be critiquing and doubting while I'm smiling. All right. So a smile just postures my heart properly. So I offer those to you. Big smile and picture yourself as a child. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to give you four minutes just to, to share your heart with Jesus. <clears throat>
Okay, if you could switch to paragraph two and just tune to flow and let Jesus share his love with you. Okay, if you could uh, draw your journey to a close in the next few moments. <clears throat> Okay, I would like to draw us back together as a large group, if I may. And we're gonna, we'd like to allow for a chance for people to share. So David, I don't know if you wanna unmute everybody so they can, or if they wanna just raise their hand and you unmute people one at a time and they raise their hand, whichever way is easier for you. But um, it's very important to 
to share your journey with someone. Um, uh, the Bible is very clear about that. There's, there's, with, there's wisdom and counsel and most of counselors. So, so if you did get something, which I'm sure I believe you probably did, and you're willing to read paragraph two, which is what the Lord spoke back to you, uh, we would love to have three or four volunteers or five, whatever, uh, just read paragraph two so we can hear the kinds of things God is saying. So if you wanted to do that, let David know. Just so wave, I'll... wave your hand if you want to uh, share. <clears throat> Plus, you have um, people in your church, too, that might want to share. Yeah. Is there anybody here that would like to share with the Lord? Okay. Come over here so the speaker can pick you up. <coughs> huh? Yeah, what the Lord wrote to you. So here's a... You guys can hear me all right? Yep, we can. So what you're writing to the Lord, I'd like to go back. What the Lord wrote back. Yeah, paragraph, paragraph two. Yeah, paragraph two. What the Lord wrote back. He says to me, uh, you're my precious son, which I've called, to, which I've called to be a witness of my heart and my life. Amen. 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 <laughs> That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else here? Sister Lydia is coming up. She's the assistant, assistant pastor here. Be careful. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what did the Lord write to you? He said, my daughter, you are who you say you are. You are the daughter of a king that will never change. No one in heaven or earth can, co can come between you and my love for you. I knew one day you would come to me and walk in my plan. Amen. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But both of those things that have been read are 100% God. So thank you for sharing them. This Somebody is, else. Sister Esther. I seen your life and I knew how much you needed my love. But you were running and running from me until I had to show my love through your little baby daughter. Amen. Help her. Thank you for sharing. It's beautiful. It's from God. 100%. Okay, uh, Brother Alex. All right, it says, uh, I love you, son. You were made for a purpose greater than yourself. Not only for the sheep, but for the family I've given to you. Don't stop or be discouraged no matter how hard it gets. Nothing will ever be easy, especially if it's done in, in my name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. Anybody it's really watching? Good. Anybody watching online? Wave your hand. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh, are you? Do you have to unmute her, uh, Mary Brown, Mark? Um. Oh, do I have to unmute people? Or, or do you want me to switch it back to me? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you switch it back to you, and you can unmute people? How'd that be? Okay. Okay. Reclaim host. There it is. Okay. Give me one second. Hold on. There you are. Okay. Uh, I cover you in love, respect. My hand holds you up. Your heart is mine. I see you. I know you. You are mine. You are a righteous daughter of our father. I have called you and you belong to me. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. Amen. 100%. 100% God, for sure. Anyone else? I see. Alexandra has a hand up and okay. Emmanuel. Let's see. It's not. Let's see. All right. Oh, wait. What happened? Well done. Matt, are you, uh, no, Michael Soto, is that, are you on mute still? Yeah, can you, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. 
I'll read mine. Uh, it says, listen to my voice as I guide you and lead you through all your trials and tribulations. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Anyone else? I think I see a hand for Alexandra and Emmanuel. I think. Where is it at? Oh, there's more. Uh, wait, how do I go to more? It's, I, I am going down. It's not doing anything. You want to switch it back to me? I think I can try. I'm muting him. Um, is that everybody in the room? So what, where's the Alexander Emanuel? Where's that at? The first, from my screen, it's the first two. Yeah. This yeah. one? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. There you are, Alexander. Amen. Uh, so my second paragraph, it says, um, my son, I have allowed you to go through these experiences because I had a plan for you ever since you were in your mother's womb. I knew what you were going through and was always with you. I have never left you or forsaken you, even when you thought I had. I love you more than you think. This is why I sent my comforter to comfort every wound, every pain. It was for you. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. 100% God. Amen. Uh, I have two more. I have uh, Leanna and Emmanuel. Hold on. Wait. Hello? Yeah, there you are. Me? Yes. So uh, um, uh, mine is, uh, I am preparing you for what is next in your life. So no matter what is going on around you, stay focused and do not place me second to anyone or anything. I know you and I know you feel guilty when you do. Stay focused and I will show you great things in your lifetime. Surrender and surround yourself with me. It, and sur uh, surrender your surrender and surround yourself uh, to me and and with me at every moment when things get dark do not forget that i am there because i have always been there do not lose your faith in me you are a powerful smile amen yeah. beautiful thank you thank you uh liana i'm unmuting her uh there it is liana yeah, he says, you are amazing and are the apple of my eye. I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you feel like giving up, keep going. And I know you are doing your best. Amen. Man, beautiful. Uh, my wife wants to read hers. Okay. I created you for me. Those who hurt you never knew me, but yet you still forgave them and loved them with the love that I gave you. I heard you as a little girl, every tear you cried, every moment you thought you were, you. Every moment you thought your existence had no worth. You are far worth more to me than anything. And this is why I have never left you. And I'm always here. And, um, Amen. Uh, Mark, Thank I you. wanna read mine. Okay. Um, it says, of course, I promised, didn't I? Would I ever leave? Would you ever leave your son in darkness? I am the light. So if I am with you, every dark situation becomes light. Cell doors cannot keep me out. I am light. To have me is to never be in darkness. Don't allow the enemy to lie to you. You are my everything also. In all creation, I needed you. I love you so much. Believe it and stand on every word that I say. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Well, everybody who shared everything they shared was 100% God. And it was also wonderful counsel from the wonderful counselor. And hearing that every morning gives you a reason to be alive and direction for your life and excitement for the day. So I just encourage everyone to spend five. You know, we didn't spend a, an hour in prayer. We spent five minutes letting God talk to us for four minutes, actually. And so in a five minute period, you can get an awful lot from God, enough to keep you rolling for the whole day or for at least a good number of, of hours. So, so I want to encourage you all to spend a few minutes 
journaling every day. And um, I do want to throw it open for questions. So if you have questions, you can ask them now. We will, you'll be doing the 12 week course and going through a 300 page book uh, on, on how to hear God's voice. So there'll be a ton of detail, which we haven't given to tonight, but it'll all, it'll all be meaningful as you go through it. The other thing is, it's the kind of course you can go through like two or three or four times because you're at a different spot every time you go through it. And uh, you hear different things, you see different things. So if you go through it once, I'm sure offers it a second time, invite some friends, bring them back and go through with your friends a second time and a third time. And, and you'll find it'll be rich every time you go through it. All right, so David, if you wanna, I don't, you can unmute everybody if you want to or whatever works for you and, and let people ask questions if they'd like to for a few well, minutes. Mark, Mark, I am, I am recording this and there are some people here that um, have not signed up with our school PLBS that, that we're doing here. Um, I love the fact that you, you were gracious enough to do this because I, I wanted to solidify that we are working with CLU. We are working with, with everything that you were doing. Um, I, I myself, you know, was in prison when I uh, signed up and enrolled with you guys and um, it was such a huge blessing to me and, and for me to now be able to have a, an affiliate school here, um, I think it's a beautiful thing. So what would you say to those that are watching this now that are not yet enrolled or in the future on the YouTube channel that watched this, what would you say to them that are not enrolled yet? Okay, David, be glad to do that. And, and yes, we are so thrilled to have your church have an affiliate campus of Christian Leadership University and uh, begin to offer our courses there. Um, <clears throat> our courses are extremely practical. I mean, you, you heard what just happened the last hour. Um, it was incredibly practical. I think you'll agree with that and workable and easy. And that makes it different from typical schools because typical schools are gonna train the head and we're gonna train the heart instead. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we don't give your head information. We did give your head information, four keys. And, and so any information your head needs so your heart can move forward in God will give you that. But it's a heart-focused curriculum. Our, our goal is to walk in the spirit and live in the spirit and to teach you how to walk and to how to live in the spirit. Um, because then the anointing is available and the anointing allows us to perform way beyond our, our natural ability, abilities. And we don't, um, we don't really learn a lesson in a one or two hour Zoom call. We, we get introduced to a concept. <clears throat> For me, I spend a year um, to learn the lesson, but once I've learned it, it's mine for the rest of my life. I, I do feel that if you have a good coach in front of you, you can learn in three months what it took them, him a year to learn. So if I can be a good coach with the videos, 10 hours of videos and a 300 page book and a workbook, 32 page, we have a 32 page workbook here too that goes with it. Um, learn four keys, hearing God's voice. So, so you actually are taking, taking notes as you go through it. And um, <clears throat> it gives you a chance to focus intensely, intently. Um, so you can be transformed by it. Um, writing is a very important part of transformation. God said to the kings of Israel, he said, when you become a king, first thing I want you to do is to write a complete copy of the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. So God is really, really big on us writing because when it comes out of our fingers, it's a much deeper learning experience than when we just hear someone talk. And um, when we practice truth in the classroom, which is what we did in the Zoom call, we practice truth in the classroom, um, then it's something you can own and remember and live with. Uh, it's very, very different than just hearing ideas and then walking out. So, so your school, your campus is gonna be a very, very different kind of a campus uh, than any school you've ever been to. I actually guarantee it. I guarantee it will transform your life, transform your marriage. Um, the voice of God, <clears throat> If you want to know what the voice of God will do for you, <laughs> you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read the first 14 verses, Deuteronomy 28. Um, in the New American Standard, it translates verse one correctly. And in the New King James, it translates verse one correctly. It says, if you hear my voice, that's what it says. If you hear my voice, that I'm going to bless you in all of these ways. You'll be above and not beneath. You'll lend and not borrow. You'll You'll be the head and not the tail, and your, your basket will be 
blessed and your leading bowl mm. will be blessed and your family will be blessed. And just list 14 verses of blessing if we can hear his voice because he gives us wonderful counsel. He gives us creative ideas. He heals our fears. He gives us courage to go on. And he blesses and anoints our path. And he opens the door before us, gives us divine encounters. But all of those promises are contingent on, can I hear his voice? So for the first 10 years of my Christian life, I couldn't walk in those covenant blessings because I couldn't hear his voice. And the rest of the of Deuteronomy 28, which goes all the way to, from 15 to 68, 68 verses, is all the covenant curses that are present when we don't hear his voice. So we're talking night and day. We're talking life versus death, um, biblically speaking. And I would say in my own life, <clears throat> I already mentioned to you that learning to hear God's voice was the most important day of, of my Christian experience because it took me from being a legalist and a Pharisee into being one who had a relationship with Jesus. Now, I always said I had a relationship with Jesus. The only problem with my relationship in the first 10 years is I couldn't hear his voice, I couldn't see him, and I couldn't feel his emotions. Now, if I would said I had a relationship with Hawaii Patty and I, and I couldn't, couldn't hear her and I couldn't see her and I couldn't feel her, that would be one really thin relationship. And, and my relationship with Jesus was incredibly thin. I mean, I loved him, but there was no direct encounter. And, you know, we used to sing a song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, back in the church I got saved in. Man, I, I never saw prayers being sweet for an hour. It was boring as could be because I was doing all the talking and who's going to be excited about listening to me talk for an hour? You know, nobody, you know, so, so now, now I can pray for an hour very easily because God does almost all the talking. He gives me creative ideas. <clears throat> he lets me excel <clears throat> and he will to you too, excel way beyond our natural ability. I mean, I planned on being a dairy farmer and, uh, which would have been fine. Um, my dad owned a farm. I was going to buy it from him and, and it, had that been God's call in my life, that, uh, that would have been my ministry, which would, would have been great. But the Lord um, has had me travel the world and teach how to hear God's voice. Uh, when I learned to hear his voice, that's, that's what God said. He said, Mark, we're gonna, you're going to transform the nation through communion with God, teaching people how to communion with me. I said, wow, the nation's really, really big, God. <laughs> I'm pretty small and I'm not a straight A student. And <clears throat> I got a lot of reasons why I probably can't do that. And God said, with my anointing, you can do that. And then a few months later, he said, Mark, uh, we're going to transform the world with a message of communion with God. And I said, well, which one is it, the nation or the world? He said, well, it's up to you. If you want to believe for the nation, I'll give you the nation. If you want to believe for the world, I'll give you the world. Wow. I said, well, I'm a, I'm a high-risk person, so I'm going to go for the world. And, and now I've traveled on six continents for 30, 35 years. Um, and we have free video seminars we run every single month off our website, uh, our Communion with God Ministries website. Um, we have people, we have about 5,000 people in over 100 nations every single month who tune in to listen to those free broadcasts. With Christian Leadership University, we have students in 129 nations that are taking courses with us. And my book on the, the, the four keys to hearing God's voice, what, what I just taught you, is translated into 55 languages. Now, I didn't plan any of this. I didn't think I was capable of doing any of this. I didn't think I could touch the world and make a difference like that. And in the natural, I couldn't. But with the anointing of the spirit, I can. And so can you. As you learn to hear his voice and walk in his voice and live out of it in faith, um, God will take you places you just never, ever dreamed you could possibly go. And so that's the reason I'm sharing my story with you, not because I'm great, but because the anointing of the spirit has allowed me to do things I um, I would never dreamed I would do. When I left college, <laughs> I said, first of all, high school was terribly boring. College was even more irrelevant and boring. I never, ever want to set foot in a school again. I can't stand school. It's, it's irrelevant to my life. And now I head up a university with students in 129 nations. So, <laughs> you know, so don't tell God what you're never going to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's the unschool school that what we're offering. And um, we're so thrilled to have your church as a part of that. And um, for every one of you who will take 12 weeks and focus on mastering this skill, your life will never, ever be the same. I, I absolutely guarantee it. And you will be able to hear God's voice easily for the rest of your life. And then you'll go on to another course. 
And every course in our university is built on the ability to hear God's voice. So even if you're going to do Bible survey, it's still going to be, uh, you know, what has God spoken to you from this section of scripture? You're going to journal. And counsel by God is letting God heal anger, fear, guilt, depression uh, in that course. And uh, prayers that heal the heart is how to overcome the deep, deep wounds and, and uh, heal them and get the demons out that are harassing us. I've been through deliverance a couple of times. I had a lady cast a dozen demons out of me or maybe 20, I guess. And I sure feel a lot better. I'm, I'm free. I don't have this stuff rising up within me, gripping me, pushing me in negative directions like anger, hatred, fear, you know, um, it, it, it's gone. It's free on the inside. And it's so nice. All right. So, so those are all courses, Christian dream interpretation. God talks to us tonight through our dreams, gives us, I mean, most of the creative inventors who got anything, they got it through dreams and visions that just lit upon their minds. And if you do go to our website and go to the search bar, our website is cwgministries.org, cwgministries.org. That stands for Communion with God Ministries.org. Um, if you type in a search bar creativity, you will find maybe half a dozen blogs on, on creativity. And I go through maybe 20 different people who are creative leaders in the world today. And they tell how they got their creativity and they all got it through flowing visions, flowing thoughts, which are coming from the spirit realm. So it's fascinating because that's what you and I get to do um, once we can honor flow and tune to flow and know enough to do that. And inventors and world changers know enough to do that. That's uh, Edison, he, he knew that when he was relaxed and in flow that creativity would come to him. So he'd take naps all the time, put some metal marble marbles in his hands so that as he drifted off to sleep and his for nap, <coughs> they would, um, his hand would loosen and they would fall to the floor and it'd wake him up. But in those few moments, he's in flow. He's, he's getting a creative solution to where he was stuck, which is why in, and throughout the day, he would just do that. And, and that's his technique that he used. And he had hundreds and hundreds of inventions and he had a technique to get creative flow. And that was his technique. So, so, um, it's a rich, rich, rich life available to every single one of you, far beyond anything you dreamed you could do. And it's because you won't be doing it with your natural ability. You'll be doing it with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And this school that David is offering to you will teach you. I guarantee you, it will teach you how to walk in the anointing of the Spirit. Every single course that's there came out of our lives, our battles to make it real. None of it's theory. It's all stuff we fought for and made it real. So it's going to be completely different than anything you've ever had in the past is there um do we have a few minutes to if anybody has a question sure okay is there anyone that has a question that you want to ask mark before we end this um anybody here we're good good well uh, somebody asked uh what does it mean to be anointed anointed <laughs> Uh, that means to be smeared with the Holy Spirit, the anointing, um, letting the Holy Spirit smear his, his life into you, rub it into you. Um, so the longer we're in his, God's presence, hearing his voice, receiving his instruction, um, honoring it, saying yes to it, um, the more anointing is going to be present in our lives. Um, the Spirit's anointing, it's, it's, it's a freedom of the Spirit to flow in any way. He can flow, giving you flowing thoughts, which is creativity, that's anointing. He can give you flowing pictures, that's anointing, that's vision and dreams. He can give you flowing power, that's anointing, anointed to heal. Um, and people tend to pick up specific anointings because they press into an area Intent, intensely and intently for months and, and years. And the healers over the last, the last hundred years, they would press into the area of healing for months or years and they would develop a super release of healing power out through their lives. Um, the shell of self-dependence was broken. Um, they learned to trust God to a deeper level any sin patterns that were hindrances to God's power flowing were dealt with uh, through 
the Holy Spirit dealing with them within their lives. And, and that allows more and more and more of the anointing or release of the Holy Spirit's power and wisdom are through you. So it's a process that just continues. As, and we each will develop an anointing for the thing that God's called us to. God had called me to teach the world how to hear God's voice. I have an anointing to teach people how to hear God's voice. I can break through the barriers in an hour. I could break through the barriers of lack of knowledge, lack of information, and lead, take you by the hand and lead you in a place where you could hear God's voice. There's not a lot of people in the world who can do that. I can do it easily. I can do it effortlessly because I spent years focused on mastering that skill and that anointing, and it's now present and resident within me. So that's a particular anointing God has given to me that goes along with the destiny that God has in my life. And for each of you, God has a destiny for your lives, and he has anointings that will help you fulfill that destiny through the power of the Holy Spirit. So those will be things that you can you know, journal about as you go along. Lord, what's your destiny and call? You know, and, and I remember... <laughs> When he told me that uh, in that first year of journaling, he's, um, he said, Mark, we're going to transform the world to the message of community with God. I said, okay, I'm ready. What, what do you want me to do first? And he said, well, I want you to love your wife. I said, well, I, I know I'm supposed to do that. I'm, I'm talking about fulfilling the vision of uh, changing the world with the message of community with God. He said, well, I want you to love your wife. I said, God, I got that, but I want you to know what am I supposed to do now to make that happen? He said, love your wife. And he told me that like 50 times because he just really felt I could have a strong, solid marriage that would be a really great foundation to be a world changer. <clears throat> and so for that first year, the step was learn not to pressure Patty <clears throat> into being what you think she ought to be. Learn to honor her as God built her and to esteem her highly and to receive her input and guide, you know, because she looks at life through a totally different lens than I do. And her perspective and everything is different than mine. And if I ask her for her perspective and then honor it, I'm a much more rounded person and a more, a more insightful person. And, and so each year I asked the Lord in January 1st, you know, what are we working, working on this year? And he'll tell me and we'll work on that. And it'll be a step to release the anointing in a, in a fresh new way. One year he said, Mark, um, this year we're going to learn, we're going to learn to, uh, you're going to learn to become a, a really good marketer because, you know, if you get a life-changing message, which I believe I have, right, and I've shared it with you here tonight, you, you want the whole world to know it. And he says, Mark, we're, this year we're going to learn how to be, we're going to learn about marketing. I said, God, I hate marketing. He said, I know you do. And, and he said, that, that's why you're no good at it. He says, because my anointing does not ride on the carrier wave of hatred. It rides on the carrier wave of love and compassion. And step number one for you is you have to develop a love and compassion for marketing so that my anointing can ride upon it so, so you can market the message effectively that I've given to you so we can change the world. And so we took a year and I learned how to market, all right? And as work, and it's working well. We give away our free course every month. They can listen free every month and then the people can buy it at half price, which is a marketing strategy that we eventually came to through the Lord's guidance and it's a brilliant strategy, you know, because once people hear it, they say, oh my gosh, that's, that's good enough to listen to two or three or four times. So I really get it. And so a whole bunch will buy it. And so we can stay financially afloat, even though we gave away top of the line stuff free every single month. Okay. So, so yes, at this point, I love marketing. <clears throat> so every year it's, it's been a new thing. You know, one year I focused on how to get the demons out for crying out loud. So I don't have this inner war within me driving me insane half the time, you know? Um, and that was a beautiful growth. And we wrote the book, Prayers That Heal the Heart that year. So, so each one of these is a, is a step that removes the barriers for the free flow of the Holy Spirit within us, enlarges our capacity to experience his flow within us and to release his flow out through us, which is what the anointing is. Amen. Anyone online that has any questions? I can unmute you. Just wave your hand at me if anyone has a question. Anyone here have a question? We're good? Yeah. All right. Well, um, man, I want to thank you, Mark, so, so much. Um, 
You have no idea what your courses have done for me. Um, and I believe that now some of the church here, now that they've heard you, I think they can see that the apple didn't fall far from the tree and far as the way I preach and the way I teach. <laughs> you know, uh, 17 people watched online. There's how many people here? 17 here. And we've recorded this. We're going to put it on a YouTube channel that has 9,600 subscribers. You know, and um, I really pray that people are going to watch this, you know, and I thank you so much. You, um, your wife, um, Cheryl, who just retired, but she has been amazing for us and, and everybody at the staff at the school. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, Dave, you're very, very welcome. We're really proud of you. The growth has taken place in your life. The Lord's redeemed your life and turned you into a positive witness. And, and we're just really proud to be teamed up with you and supporting you and, and having you help spread the message of spiritual intimacy with the world. So bless you and thank you. Thank you. God bless everyone. Thank you for being with us. All right, folks. God bless. Bye-bye.